If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to the book of, of uh, 1 Thessalonians. Look at 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 1. And verse number 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 12. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and in ye and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. If you notice in one verse, the Apostle Paul uses the full title the Lord Jesus Christ, two times. The name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants you to understand that he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God hath made this Jesus both Lord and Christ whom you crucified and hung on a tree. The Lord Jesus Christ is the full title of the Son of Man. He referred to himself time and again as the Son of Man. But the Lord means that he's the owner of everything. Jesus is his earthly name of humiliation. And Christ designates him as the anointed of God, the Messiah. So therefore when I speak of him and give his full title, I call him the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a very rare term. You hardly ever hear that term anymore. I've listened to a lot of preaching lately, and I seldom ever hear the term, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's spoken of more in the sense of Jesus, my buddy, Jesus, my friend, Jesus this and Jesus that. And of course, Jesus is certainly his name. But there is definitely an honor that's due to him. There's something about him that should be set aside that we should understand just exactly who we're talking about. We're not talking about one of the buddies. He's not my buddy that I drink with on Saturday. No, no, no. He's not my buddy that I go fishing with. He's not the buddy that I go hunting with. No, he's not my pool buddy. No, 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 no. He's not my buddy. He's my Lord, Jesus Christ. A lot of people today have a hard time with that because they are so self-centered and egotistical. This is the self-love generation you've been preached to time and time and time again by your pastor and your evangelist who told you to love yourself. And now that you've become very good at it, what's it brought you to? Does your wife still love you or does your husband still love you? Now that that spouse realizes you love yourself more than you do them? Because that's exactly where it leads. Self-love is one of the most destructive, detrimental things that could ever happen to you once again. I put this challenge to you or anybody you've known or ever met. Show me one time in those 66 books of Holy Writ where the Bible ever commands you one time to love yourself. In every place that you find self-love, it's an observation. It's a, it's a comparison. Nowhere does it tell you to love yourself. But the Apostle Paul says in the last days, men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents and so forth and so on. Unplug yourself from the spirit of this age and get on your knees and read your Bible and get a hold of God. You'll find out that there's a different spirit inside the church houses that you go to. All churches are not created the same. Just because they have a cross on the door or the window, a steeple on top of the, ha on top of the roof, does not make them the church of the living God. Amen. Satan hates the church of God. He hates the church that preaches the truth because the truth will make you free. So this morning I'm going to preach to you about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the foundation of the church. He's the object of the church. He's the reason we met together this morning. He's the one who awakened me this morning and put me to bed last night. He's the one that I live for. My life is about the Lord Jesus Christ. I have an enemy. He hates me and despises the truth of the gospel. He fights every turn that we go. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. There is a dark, evil world 
that is opposed to the truth of the Word of God. So the Lord Jesus Christ will be exalted and glorified in this house today. I'm going to go through some points that I've made about him, and I want to show you how the Bible is about Christ. He said to the two on the road to Emmaus, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. Then the Bible says he spoke to the two on the road to Emmaus, and he opened up the Word of God and showed them himself in the scriptures. And they said their hearts burned within them when he showed them the Word of God. Can you imagine one who created the universe, made all this intricate detail that you enjoy in your daily life, understanding that a body, a human body, is made up of trillions of souls, it's trillions of cells, and each one of those cells is so complicated that it is in itself an, old, an entirely different world. Imagine one that is so brilliant, and I don't like to use the word brilliant, because God is all-knowing. All He's omniscient. He knows everything. But just imagine today, my friend, one who created everything that exists. Can you not imagine that if you open up this book, that it will have the same depth of meaning that came from the mind of Almighty God. Don't ever think that your little mind will be able to pluck from the depths of the Bible the great truths of Scripture without the Holy Spirit's revelation. You will pump your ego up by making yourself think that you can master the Word of God. But until the Word of God masters you, you'll go on in your egotism and your pride and your arrogance. This is the living Word of the living God. Imagine, my dear friend, how interesting and complicated it can become. The apostle said there are things that are hard to be understood. So let's look at the types in the Old Testament of the Lord Jesus. The lamb skins that were brought are a picture of how his sacrifice was given for us when God covered Adam and Eve. Notice he covered them. They tried to cover themselves, but it was a waste of time. The arks in the Old Testament, the ark of Noah and the ark of Moses, both of these arks are types of the Lord Jesus Christ. In one, it carried them from the old world into the new world. In the other, it made approach to God possible because there he met with him on the mercy seat. In the Old Testament, it prophesied of Christ. He was the seed of the woman. 6,000 years ago, Genesis 3.15, God said, the woman would have a seed. That's an utter impossibility. But all things are possible with God. He was the prophet likened to Moses, and he certainly is likened to Moses. And that he's Shiloh that Jacob prophesied about. Yeah. In the book of Genesis, the one who brings peace to us who know him. In the Old Testament, he appeared and it's called Christophanes. These Christophanes simply means an appearance of Christ before he was incarnate as the man of God. Here we find him called Melchizedek. It could be him that showed up to Abraham there. It could be Christ. But my friend, he's also the man in the furnace with the three Hebrew children, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He's probably the angel that Jacob wrestled with at Peniel and he wouldn't turn him loose. And then he's the one who walked with Adam when he made him in the garden in the cool of the day. In the Old Testament, he is incarnate. The Arnkin incarnation is prophesied of the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman, therefore, becomes a prophecy of God, something that comes from above, something that is supernatural and a revelation from the Almighty. The Lord Jesus Christ did not come from man, but he came from glory. He's called Abraham's seed. He's Abraham's seed because Abraham believed God. And that element of faith that accepted God's promise brought forth the Lord Jesus Christ in the womb of the Virgin Mary. My friend, 2,000 years later, when she accepted by faith the prophecy of Gabriel that she would bring forth a son, and so she did. The Lord Jesus Christ was born to die. He was born to go to a cross. I die because I'm born. But he was born to die. He had the shadow of the cross ever before him because he came into this world to give his life a ransom for you and a ransom for me. My friend, in glorification, the Lord Jesus Christ become, begins to unfold for us the whole plan of God and what he is all about. What do you mean in glorification, preacher? In the book of Revelation, chapter number 1, we read about the Lord Jesus Christ as he appeared after he hung on the cross and bled and died. It says, In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, 
as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like into fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice of the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. The Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter number 1 is appearance of him the first time we see him after his resurrection when he is in glory. And it talks about the glory of the Son of God in manifestation to the Apostle John. If you go back to the book of Daniel chapter number 7 and read about the Ancient of Days, you'll see that the Lord Jesus Christ appears just like the Ancient of Days in Daniel chapter number 7. So what does that mean, preacher? It means that now in glory, the Son of God is both prophet, priest, and king. He is here in Revelation chapter number 1 as a ruling king, prophet, and priest who is going to come, Revelation chapter number 19, and take the kingdoms of this world and they will become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, for the first time, shows us what He's going to look like in glory. He's going to be something for the eye to behold and we will see Him as He is. In glorification, the Lord Jesus Christ Christ was resurrected from the dead. In Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 4, the Bible makes this statement about him. Romans chapter number four, 1 and verse number 4. This is a powerful statement about the Son of God. Paul the Apostle says, a servant of Jesus Christ. And it says, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And then in verse number 4, he is declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. The Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. In the book of Psalm, chapter number 2, in verse number 7, the Scripture says, I will declare the decree, The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. This is a familiar Old Testament Scripture that looks back to the Lord Jesus Christ being spoken to by the Father. Now when the Father speaks to His Son, how would the Son as an infant in the, in the manger hear the voice of the Father? This must be something that took place later on when He was raised from the dead. And when He was raised from the dead, God the Father spoke to His Son and said, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten Thee. The Lord Jesus Christ was not born again at His resurrection. But at His resurrection, something powerful took place that has a direct bearing on who we are and what we are to this very day. There is more in this text than I have yet to see in all the years that I've read the Bible. God keeps taking me back to Romans chapter number 1 and says to me, Son, keep praying and keep reading that and I'm going to show you something about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another scripture says that we had, he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. The Apostle Peter says that we have been begotten again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This being begotten is directly connected with his resurrection. His high priesthood is connected with his resurrection. The declaration from above and the word here in Romans chapter number 1 means... He was appointed. He was picked out. He was directly spoken to at His resurrection by God the Father from the dead. When the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, He looked like any other man. The two thieves on there, one on one side and one on the other, looked no different from Him. There was no beauty about Him that we should behold Him. When He walked down the street, He could, not be, he could easily be mistaken for someone else. No halos around His head. They didn't know who He was. Not unless God revealed him. But at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, something took place that was not here on this earth. Something powerful took place that is in heaven. Something is there in the presence of God that's going to come back to this earth. And when he comes back to this earth, we shall see him as he is. I know that when John made that statement, he knew within his soul there's a whole lot more than we understand now about the risen, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. So I believe the Apostle John got the first glimpse of the Son of Man who is prophet, priest, and king before he was never all three at the same time. While he was here on this earth, he was prophet, 
prophesying and he said to the children of Israel how many prophets like unto me have you not killed and slain and driven from your midst there at the cross at Calvary as the prophet he was nailed to a tree and there began his priesthood he began to offer himself unto God the Father the offering of the Son of God is a twofold thing it's something that you've got to think about First of all, he offers a sacrifice unto God that is pleasing unto God the Father. But secondly, he's the one doing the offering there upon the cross. He's giving of himself. And therefore, he becomes the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. A propitiation is a sacrifice that satisfies and settles an antagonistic one to the other. It is something that goes down where God Almighty looks at the sacrifice and he's settled in his heart. He's pleased in his soul. The anger is moved aside and now he is satisfied. He is at peace with mankind. Therefore the offering of the Lord Jesus Christ brought peace between God and men. <laughs> He that was angry with the wicked every day. And now there is one in heaven who is at peace with mankind through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no peace outside of the son of God. There is still, my friend, anger. The Bible says that men are enemies of God in their mind. And that will never change until the son of man, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes back to this earth. In application, he's the savior. In the Bible, it teaches plenty. Mainly there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior of all mankind, especially of those that believe. What does that mean, preacher? It simply means that there is no Savior outside of Christ. But for those who believe, He becomes a personal Savior. And I believe. Do you believe? Do you have a Savior? Do you have a Savior? When you look at all the religions of the world, and look at Buddhism, look at Mohammedism, look at Confucianism, look at Jainism, look at all of them and compare them. And not one single religion on this earth has a Savior outside of what we believe. We have a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we have a Savior, preacher? Because I need to be saved. That's why we have a Savior. And so they all come short. He therefore is the Savior. He's able to save them to the uttermost. His salvation is complete salvation. He's worthy, the Bible says in the book of Revelation. Men need to be saved from themselves. Your biggest enemy is you. And the greatest power that you'll ever ex have ex exercised in your life is when you begin to realize how the power of the Holy Spirit of God can break the bondage of your will, the bondage of your mind, the bondage of you and break that bondage and make you free in Christ Jesus. It is that old man, that old nature that you can't get away from. You can leave me, you can leave anybody in this house, you can, get, you can even flee from sin, but you can't flee from yourself. Yourself is with you 24 seven, night and day, and you've got to learn to win the victory over yourself. Thinking good thoughts won't do it. Having positive thoughts won't do it. Somebody telling you how to get this and how to do that, that's not gonna help you. So then how do I do it, preacher? The Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the key to break the bondage of your own will and your own mind. And therefore you must learn how to apply that. The Apostle Paul says to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Take off this old man. How do you take him off, preacher? You take him off by turning against him. You take him off by identifying him. You take him off by understanding who and what he is. The apostle says, there dwelleth in me, my flesh, my mind, no good thing. I reckon myself to be dead. I settle in my heart. I am no good. I'm talking about the old me. I'm talking about the me that can think with his fleshly mind. There's no good in it. And so I take him off. Then I put on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
when I put him on, I put on his righteousness. I put on his mind. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ. I put on my friend him. I cover myself in the Son of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. I put on someone greater than I am. I begin to turn to him and seek him and pray to him and call on his holy name because he becomes the object of my life and my love. If he's not, then you're giving him lip service. You're telling him you love him, but you're acting the hypocrite in front of him. Don't you think Christ knows more than that? Don't you think God knows your heart better than that? So I put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And by putting him on, I wake up in the morning and say, Good morning, Lord. I go to bed at night and say, I'll love you, Jesus. I go in my closet and shut the door and get on my face. And I cry out to his high and holy name. I open the Bible and I take it and lay it in my lap. And I say, Lord, where do you want me to read in the holy word of God? You say, that's too religious for me, preacher. I'm not talking about religion. Religion stinks. Religion will kill you. Religion's dead. You bought into the lie of the devil. You let Satan categorize everything for you. You've got a secular world, a religious world. This, that, that doesn't exist. There is one world. And either you live for Christ or you don't live for him. I live for him whether it's in secular or whether it's in the church or wherever it is. But Satan will let you categorize things. Why does he do that, preacher? Because you're one person on Sunday. You're another person on Monday. You're the guy I work with, but you sure don't act the same way in church. You're the fellow that I go fishing with, but you're different over here. I, you change. You're here. You're there. No, friend. You are what you are. Whether you are at work, whether you are at church, or wherever you might be. And if you change, it's because you're acting. And put this down in your book, folks. There are no actors in hell. Nobody is acting. What you are at home is what you are here. And if what you are at home is not what you are here, you are a hypocrite. And the word hypocrite comes from the Greek word hypokritos. And it means actor. And that's exactly what's going on in the lives of a lot of people. That's why the church services are dead. That's why you have to pump them up with rock and roll. That's why you got to bring people in and let them live like hell and then on Sunday make them feel good. And so you pump them up with the same slop they get all week long. And you mix in a little religion with it. And then you walk out of there feeling good about yourself and you're so in love with yourself that everything's got to be hunky-dory. And so now somebody has reached you. Yeah, they're reaching you, all right. They're reaching you with something that's sending you to hell. Sure, you can be reached with that, just like a rock band can reach you. And you can get into a religious mosh pit if you want to. And you can have an ex you can have a worship experience if you please but that's not going to do you one bit of good for you're still the same old man half of your marriages are still breaking up in divorce 60 to 70 percent of your children are still being born out of wedlock you're still filling up the dope rehab centers you're still full of cursing and blaspheming and you still hate God who reached you nobody's reached you Christ can. Christ can. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Well, I haven't heard a preacher talk to me like that. You haven't heard half. I'm a modern preacher. You should dig up one from a hundred years ago. You couldn't stand five minutes of that kind of preaching. Amen. I gave it to you straight. Amen. I told you the truth. And you can't listen to rock music, country music, garbage all week long and then come to church on Sunday morning and feel goosebumps because you sing a few little religious songs. Amen. You can't sit in front of a tube and watch every kind of filth sit in front of a computer and watch your pornography. You can't blaspheme with your mouth, live like hell all week long, and then come to church on Sunday and expect a blessing from God. If you can go to a church where you can live like I'm talking about, fornicate like I'm talking about, dope it like I'm talking about, and then go to that church on Sunday and feel good, you're in a hell hole. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Sometimes you just got to tell it straight like it is. And I'm telling you the truth. We got people that come in here and they're like zombies. But you let a rock band fire up, you get some garbage going. It wakes them, it awakens them. Why? Because it, it immediately feeds the flesh. They're flesh eaters. That's all they know is the flesh. They don't have any spiritual content in their soul. So what are we here for then? Are we here to pump up your flesh? You know, I'll tell you the truth. If it was left up to me, I'd take every pew out up here. I'd empty this choir. I'd eliminate the choir. And instead of you being entertained when you come in here, I'd make you sing. What do you think about that idea? I've watched some of your faces so long and I know exactly what to expect. The minute the choir starts, I mean, I've looked at it, friend. I mean, I have watched it. They, you, you, you don't realize it. You don't. But you go into this habit. You, you go through doing the same thing over and over, week after week. I know exactly. I can tell you, I can, I can be a quarter of a mile away and watch you walk, and I know who you are. That's how long I've known some of you. And so when you come into this house, and they get up here in the choir, and they go through, the, where's the choir at in the New Testament? They didn't have any choirs when they first started. I mean, our brother Silvius is doing a fine job. He's probably frustrated a lot of times as bad as I am. Frustrated. Because he's up here trying to lead a choir and you all are out there just being entertained. Yeah. Let's go into business. How many would like to get rid of the choir and let's just forget it? We can add a whole lot of seating right here. And then we can, then we, a whole lot pe more people can be seated. And then we could be, uh, we could have a, we could have, we could have an expansion going on in here. And everybody come in here, they know they're going to get to, they're going to have to sing. Because when the choir leader or the church or the auditorium leader gets up here in front of you, the song leader gets up here in front of you, he doesn't have to worry about anybody behind him. He just focuses his attention on you. And then everybody's got to sing. What do you think about that? We won't do it that fast, but I, you all think about it. <laughs> I wouldn't pull one on you like that. <laughs> Give you something to think about when you go home, though. Amen? Amen. It's a better spirit in here now than it was when I started. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Help us. It felt like a cold rag thrown in my face when I got up here this morning. How many of you felt that? I mean, this is one of the deadest places I've been in a long time. I go walk to that cemetery and get more life out there. At least I got some birds singing out there and squirrels jumping from tree to tree. In here, just a bunch of dead zombies. I don't know what kind of week you had, but I hope it's better next week. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Where were we? <laughs> Second coming. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I've always had a fault in doing this. I have to confess to you this morning. I've always had this fault, if you want to call it a fault. I preach what I believe. And when something comes upon me like it did this morning, I've got to give you the truth. And you ought to appreciate the fact now some of you deep down inside your soul, you've been to every kind of a Mickey Mouse rock rap church in this town. I mean, they were talking in Sunday school this morning. This brother was talking about his little granddaughter. He's talking about a church they go to, and I'm not going to mention any names. That's not necessary. But in that church, it's okay if you shack up. It doesn't matter. God still loves you. Everything's okay. Let's come on in here. Let's just have us a good worship service and blah, 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 blah. Don't you want something better than that? Don't you really? Don't you want something better than that? You can dope it and do anything else. You know, it's just okay. No, it's not okay. Don't you want something better? We can have something better here at Temple. We can. We can have something better here at Temple than that kind of garbage. And God doesn't judge your spirituality by what you don't do. Just because we don't do all these things. 
I mean, we're not, we don't approve fornication. We don't approve doping. We don't approve it. We don't approve shacking up. We don't approve it. We don't approve it, but that won't make you spiritual. What will make you spiritual then, preacher? The spirit of the living God. Don't grieve him. Don't turn him away. Start a prayer life. Start reading your Bible. Preacher Lawson, if I, if I preach for two hours on Sunday, I'm not going to be able to pump you up spiritually. I cannot take the place of your own spiritual relationship with the Lord. I can't do it, folks. I cannot do it. You've got to have your own walk with God. And you've got to read His Word and pray. And there's no substitute for it. And you've got to do it every day. Father, in Jesus' name. I preached what you put on my heart, Lord. We needed it. I pray you'd glorify yourself this morning. We need your presence, Lord. And the only thing you'll honor is the truth. And Lord, if I didn't preach the truth, I want you to show me where I failed, where I missed it. Show me when I get home. Burn it in my heart and burn it in my soul. Convict me of it if I didn't preach the truth. But at this point right now where I stand before you, Lord, I have complete and total peace that I preached the truth. I preached what men and women need to hear. May they respond to it. May they say this will be a new day. I can't watch this garbage I've been watching all week long on TV and live for you, Lord. I can't do that. I can't do that, Lord. I can't sit in front of a computer and look at pornography and think I'm going to have a good, loving husband and wife relationship, and it's not going to affect me spiritually. I can't shoot up my dope and take my pills and... I can't do it. I can't, I can't be hooked on drugs and think I can live for you. I can't blaspheme and defile your holy name week in and week out and think that I'm going to be able to come to church and worship God. I can't do it. Well, if you said I can't to any of those things, thank God for it. And won't you do something about it this morning? Won't you do something? I'm not interested in numbers. If you look at that board back there in the back, there are no numbers on that wall. I got no use for numbers. No numbers, no numbers. It's just about you personally. Did you hear something today that'll help you? Why don't you do something about it? Why don't you come down here? Bless your name, Lord. Bless your holy name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, Brother Sylvia. Page 112 in your All American. 112. You come hear the blessed Savior calling me a friend. Oh, ye heavy Savior, come to me and rest. Come, come on to Terry, I your Lord will bear. Won't you come? Bring me My experience has been that for most people, it's not the big stuff. Most, most people that go to church, at least around here that I know, here at Temple, I don't think you're into fornication. I don't think you're into dope. I don't think that. But I do believe that you waste a lot of your time sitting in front of junk and that it is deadening your senses and that it is filling your heart full of garbage and it is robbing you of your fellowship with the Lord. But I'm going to tell you where it'll lead you. It'll lead you into the stuff. It'll lead you into the heavy stuff. You'll be, you'll, be, uh, you'll be cheating on your wife or cheating on your husband. Never thought you'd ever do a thing like that, and you wind up doing it. A lot of other stuff, all kinds of stuff. One thing, one sin leads to another sin. Sin's like misery. Sin likes company. <laughs> oh, yeah. One sin leads to another. Never isolated alone. It leads to something else. 
Well, we'll sing one more verse. I'll give you an invitation if you'd like to come down here and pray with us this morning. We'll pray. What you say? Appreciate you listening. I've been at this a long time, folks, a long time. And I guess in that in that period, and sometimes I think experience can be detrimental. I think it can hurt you because you depend on experience. But uh, this has been a battle this morning. The church is we've we've been in a battle. But sometimes the Lord allows battles like that for us to refocus what we're all about. Yeah, amen. This is a good church because you support the truth but it's made up of sinners but you support the truth I'm thankful for that but don't ever let an air of arrogancy come into your heart and don't ever let pride build up in your soul when you compare yourself with somebody else the Bible said comparing themselves with themselves are not wise what it should build in us is a hunger and a desire to see the power of God I want to see the power of God at temple the power of God, folks. Churches today give lip service to that. That doesn't mean a thing to them. But I'd like to see people to walk down here and get on their knees and get up from here healed. I'd like to see people come in here bound up with drugs and get up free. I'd like to see broken marriages and broken homes come in here and be put together again. And I'd like to see hell-bound sinners get on their face and get up from there born again by the grace of God. That's what I want to see. That's what I want to see. That's the power of God. You see your sons and daughters saved. You see your husbands and wives saved. Your mothers and fathers saved. Amen. Because there is a devil's hell that you don't want to go to. And if Satan can do anything in the church to hinder that, hinder the work, hinder the ministry, he's going to do it. And make no mistake about it, you do not, arg you do not uh, war against flesh and blood. Your battle is spiritual. Amen. It's against Satan. All right. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. Meet again this evening, 6 o'clock, for the evening service. And pray the good Lord meet here with us. I pray the service this evening is in a completely, entirely, absolutely different service than we had this morning. But what we had this morning was for a reason. Amen. All right, Brother Van Caldwell.